into level three, being three levels into level three. Uh, range ball hitter, player, tournament, pretty good player. And then you've got the top 60, and I think the last level was, you know, Tiger Woods. That's right. Well, Aaron Battery. Uh, yeah. W once you make it to the tour, okay, yeah, it, it's kind of foolish for anyone, anyone to say that this guy is not that good. If he weren't that good, he wouldn't be on the tour. So there has to be a reason why this person is struggling. And, and, and I think that in this book, it will describe what is necessary, what work ethic you have to have to get to where you want to go. And, and golf is one of those games where you never really own it. Jack Nichols said that you, you can only rent it for a certain period of time. And the work ethic that's required, as Greg Norman said recently, you talking to the media, you people do not understand the amount of work that it takes to compete at this level. Greg Norman being, you know, a supremely successful businessman, but he, he understands that he does not have the time nor the desire to spend all this effort playing, you know, championship golf. So unless you're willing to make that commitment, you, your, your success is limited. So you, you'll have to make that choice yourself. We're only here to help you. And I'm hoping that later on we'll be able to talk to Alan and uh, really get the lowdown of if you want to play senior golf and you're not a fully qualified exempt, <laughs> exempt player coming off a 35 year PGA Tour uh, career, you better get ready. Well, you it's, better get ready. It's, it's, it's getting more difficult every year. Yeah. To get onto the senior tour, but um, Alan's story is one that we're going to share with you, and we're very proud to do that. And I think that all of you will get motivation from this this man's story. I mean, it's not as, if you will, uh, filled with pain and sorrow as Grant Ben Hogan's story, but this man had a great understanding of what it took in terms of sacrifice, in terms of family, very committed family man and yet still achieved great success. Yeah. And we want to share that story with you, and we will do so. Well, thanks again, Marty. I appreciate your time out here today. And uh, let's share some more stories with our, with our readers okay. about Chandler and things like that. Okay. All right. You know, Marty, in this uh, part of the video, I'd like the people to understand a little bit about who you are, where you come from, and uh, your background as a golf professional golf instructor. Okay. Well, uh, my, my journey through uh, golf has been very unusual. I uh, started out uh, being an Air Force golfer, if you will, an Air Force brat, and I never had any intention of taking the game too serious. I just enjoyed it as a nice pastime and uh, had the good fortune of meeting someone who was very generous and helped me quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I knew it, I was on my way to Penn State University <laughs> as a college golfer. Uh, it was very, very unusual. It was almost as if God had something to say about it. But I uh, had a very enjoyable uh, four years at Penn State and played against some great golfers uh, and uh, two All-Americans on the golf team, a gentleman by the name of Dan O'Neill and another by the name of Fred Von Bargen. And uh, we had a very good golf team. Uh -huh. So I was very fortunate. But uh, one gentleman I would like to acknowledge is a gentleman by the name of Chandler Harper. I've mentioned him earlier in the video. Chandler was one of the true gentlemen of the game, a peer of uh, Byron Nelson's and Ben Hogan's. Right. And uh, played in before Arnold Palmer's time, which right, is, right. if you will, before golf for most people. But uh, he's in the Hall of Fame. And I'd like to share one particular story to you. He played in a tournament called the Texas Open at Breckenridge Park in Texas. Mm -hmm. And unbelievably, this gentleman shot 63, 63, 63. Wow. So for people to say that you can't follow a good round with a, another good round doesn't register with me. <laughs> and then further on that story, he went to the U.S. Open the next week. After the first nine holes, coming to the ninth green, he was four over par, incredibly. And he said to his caddy, if I don't birdie this hole, I'm picking up and going home. 
Well, the long of the story is he did birdie the hole, and he finished second in the U.S. Open that year. Wow. This gentleman, uh, his skill was, uh, I can't even describe it. Mm -hmm. And again, a true gentleman of the game treated me as good or better than his own son. What was the story you told me once about him aiming at the cart path? Oh, yes. Well, on this particular day, we were playing in Richmond, Virginia at a new course. And uh, he was having a pretty good day. And he was he kept teeing up his golf ball right next to the right-hand marker near the cart path. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand as to why, whether it was a dog leg right or a dog leg left, he kept teeing it up on the right-hand tee marker. And I said to him, expecting this very complicated, sophisticated <laughs> answer, why, Chandler, do you keep teeing up on the right-hand side of the marker? And his answer to me was, Martin, it's closer to the cart path. <laughs> well, you know, that's a lot of uh, things that we try to do is boil it down to the simplicity, keeping it simple. It's like Bobby Jones said, you know, trying to it's exactly right. trim away this and trim away that just, just to keep it simple. Well, I, I, think, I think that's a very good message to you aspiring players out there. Don't make it too complicated. Right. It's all about your work ethic, understanding the whys of what you're doing, and applying the, the knowledge that you have to given situations. And the D word. Absolutely. You've got to have the D word, which is desire. And under no circumstance do you ever accept no for an answer. Mm. You know, you can't do this. You're not good enough. You're right. not long enough. Right. You're not this enough. Right. Absolutely not. do not accept people that are around you. I'm not saying negative people. I'm just saying people actually with good intentions will tell you things like that. Yeah, yeah. That, and, uh, you know, you're, you're not big enough. You're not tall enough. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and do not. What I'm saying to you is pretty much score your own agenda yep. and uh, chart your own path. And believe me, if you do that, you will have success. You know, I, I, I got a friend, and you know my friend Rick. And he's on the tour now. He's a trainer, a personal trainer that travels, you know, with the tour now. And I asked him, I said, what do you see is the biggest difference between players that achieve and players that do not achieve, and he said, they do not believe. The players that don't achieve, they do not believe. They're waiting for something to happen in order for them to believe. That's correct. You know, I, I, they're, they're waiting for an external force. Well, when I win, then I know I can win. That's right. Instead of knowing when you go out there, like Jack Nicklaus said, I go to win. That's I'm right. not just showing up. Tiger said it this year. Well, like I said, uh, my friend that travels with the tour now, he's a personal trainer, uh, travels with the PGA Tour, and I asked him, what is the difference between players that achieve and players that do not? And he told me that the players that don't achieve, they do not believe. They're waiting for an external force to happen so that they can believe. In other words, if I can win, then I will believe. And uh, uh -huh. the guys that win believe they can win before they get out there. Yes, I believe that. I believe that, that uh, when you've had success, like for example, Tiger's had as mm -hmm. young as he, he truly believes that he is the top of the pack. Yeah. And so therefore, when he goes out to a tournament, he, he's not having any doubt that he will miss the cut. Right, right. He, he is going to do everything in his power to try to win that tournament. Right. He doesn't have any uh, hesitancy, if you will, to hit a putt hard enough and have uh, uh, doubts right. that he will do things that are inappropriate. But in order to overcome a doubt, Marty, uh, in order to believe first, like what we were talking about earlier, what you were saying earlier, it's the small steps, Absolutely. just one little step at a time. That's right. You can't look for this quantum thing to happen and to, to, to change your life. Absolutely not. Mm. And in fact, the tour has proven that. There have been numerous winners, as we have discussed, yep. the U.S. Open being the glaring example. People have won the U.S. Open and completely di disappeared. Never heard of them again. Andy North, I, you know, not to mention or to put anybody down, but there have been numerous players. Uh, Steve Jones, mm -hmm. uh, recently Angel Cabrera. They're good players, no question. You've got to be a good player. 
to win the U.S. Open. But yeah. when you have success too quickly, it's sometimes a hard burden to bear. Yeah, Robert Gamez. That's exactly right. You know, Gary Hallberg. They not they could not. These guys could not maintain. Lose. Right. Well, they couldn't lose when they first got out there, and then they couldn't maintain. That's right. You know, for whatever reason, I'm sure the reasons are valid enough, right. you know. Well, in current times, of course, we're talking about David Duvall. Oh, my. David Duvall, right. his fall right. from grace has been uh, unbelievable. Now, granted, David had some reasons. Yeah. However. All the reasons are valid enough. That's right. There's not, not, I'm not questioning that and his dedication and such, but once he fell from grace, he never was able to even resemble the player that he used to be. Right. Well, his prior priorities apparently changed. I don't know That's for exactly sure, but right. you know, if he's gotten a family now, those things mm -hmm. take they, they take prior yeah, they take priorities, you know, and but I will go back to our our base player, our, our favorite player who it's all based on and uh, I you know, there have been some golf writers, some very cynical golf writers recently that uh, you know, say that when you're basing stuff off of Hogan, you know, it's like basing it off of a demigod. But I will, I will say this to you. Nobody is going to work like Hogan did. Not now. But Ben Hogan, as far as we all know, did not have any children. And the times were different back then. The right. wife was 110% committed behind him. And behind him. And Hogan had the opportunity to work on his game as much as he wanted day and night. Whereas today, right. like Jack Nicholas said, you don't have to work hard or, or you don't have to win to be a millionaire. Right. All you gotta do is be a top 100 player and you're a millionaire. As a matter of fact, you even told me right. that you get a tour card that's worth a million dollars. That's correct, You know. absolutely. So if a guy's coming off of nowhere, you know, I dare say, <laughs> our, you know, our- Priorities group, change. Uh, our, when, when you've been living on $20,000 a year, yeah. which is basically starvation on the PGA Tour because yeah. of the costs involved, of travel and et cetera. And now you're making in one week $180,000. I have the privilege of knowing one of the top tour caddies on the PGA Tour, his name is Damon Green. Right. And Damon is, is uh, granted a great caddy, no question. But I mean, Damon even told me since he caddied on Zach Johnson's bag at the Masters, he never could have dreamt that he would achieve the success as a player that he has as a caddy. Mm, and uh, right. he's very well liked, very well respected. And a great player. And a great player too, that's yeah, correct. And, a great and why it's important to be a great player, to be a good caddy, is that there are certain situations that you can only learn what is required by being a player. Right, right. And I've said that to many of my boys that I teach. Um, I'll share a little story with you. A, a caddy friend of mine, a very fine gentleman, was caddying for a, a gentleman who happened to be in Connecticut on a, a private country club that had unbelievably slick greens. Mm -hmm. And every time he gave this guy the yardage, he would come up short. Mm -hmm. And the, the player actually, after a few holes, got upset with him. He says, why are you giving me the wrong yardage? And he says, well, what you don't know, Mr. Smith, is that I'm keeping you below the hole every shot, mm. which, is a, which is only a professional caddy would know that. Right. He, you do not want to be 25 feet above the hole on a, a Stimp 13 U.S. <laughs> right. Open golf course. Right, right. So uh, this is the type of thing that professional caddies uh, know and do every day. Right. Well, you know, I was we had mentioned earlier about Alan, Alan Doyle, and uh, Alan reminds me, and I know he's reminded you of a lot of Ben Hogan. I'm wondering if there's any more Alan Doyles left, you know, out there. Uh, Alan, of course, if you don't know the story. He didn't get his card until he was 47 or 48 years old, didn't turn pro. And I interviewed Alan uh, at the 2008 Outback Tournament in Tampa, and Alan told me point blank he didn't think he was good enough to compete at that time in the, I guess it was, this was in the 70s and the 80s, and yet he had won several state opens. He was a collegiate player. Walker Cup player. Walker Cup, Porter Cup. Cup. Uh, was it Porter Cup? Yes. Yes. And Absolutely. this man beat Tiger Woods at Sonny Hana, beat Tiger Woods, One David Duvall, J Justin Leonard, Phil Mickelson. He beat them all. Right. And he was a 45-year-old man in the textile business, and he said to me he did not think he was good enough. 
Well, what's amazing about that story is this man did accomplish these goals as a part-time golfer. Unbelievable. Every one of those people that you just mentioned are totally committed, if you will, 24-7. Yes. If they're not hitting balls on the range, they're thinking about it. Yeah. So they're 24-7 uh, professional golfers and very talented and accomplished yep. players and yet this man as a part-time golfer in the textile business was was able to accomplish an unbelievable task and and today enjoys a very fine reputation as a great humanitarian yes uh, they've done great things for the world of golf for charities for yep. hospitals and of course a two-time U.S. Senior Open Champion, which validates that it was not a fluke. It was not a fluke, and he's won numerous times on the Senior Tour, and uh, we, like I said, I hope to be able to interview him right. again. Well, as a lesson to all of you out there, or not a lesson, but as something to give you uh, hope that, that you can accomplish this through hard work, there is no question that everything was stacked against this man. Yes. He, uh, he had two lovely daughters, or three yet, in fact, I think and, maybe and, just two, uh -huh. two and, or three, I can't remember. And uh, was totally devoted to his family. And uh, Had a military career. That's yeah, correct. Had a military commitment, what and, he said. And uh, he, he just, uh, you know, he had a, a world of talent, but sacrificed it all for yes. the benefit of his family. Yes. And again, I emphasize to all of you out there, priorities are absolutely integral to this task. If you don't have perspective, what's important and what's not, as much as you want to make that 10-foot putt to win the U.S. Open, guess what? The price of tea, gasoline, does not change <laughs> because you missed that putt. Nobody really cares. That's right. That's Your caddy right. might care. <laughs> that's right. I got another $10,000, but that's right. not really because he's, right. he's going to do all Making, right. That's you know. right. If, if an A caddy on the PGA Tour uh, is, is uh, disappointed by that story, what you just said, he doesn't know where his bread is buttered. <laughs> He's making so much money. Uh, I, I know that for a fact, and God bless them. Yeah. They work extremely Absolutely. hard and deserve everything. Make it all. But uh, they, 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 uh, they, they, they know darn well. Uh, there's an old saying amongst the caddies on the tour, we do not play for the cash, we play for the splash. <laughs> yeah, if right. you can't make a splash out there, son, you don't belong out there. <laughs> you know, we had uh, mentioned earlier about if you go to any club in America, any club in the world, you are going to find a driving range pro. Right. They're, they're everywhere. And these are guys that hit the ball a mile. Course records and every, you know, accolades from top to bottom, and yet they cannot make the tour. Right. And they're not going to make the tour. And we've discussed well, several well, reasons today why. Well, Mr. Trammell, isn't that why we're here? That is, that's why we're here, to help you, the level three player, get over this hump you're in, I tell you. Establish yourself a roadmap of get a where plan. you want to be. That's exactly right. You want to accomplish X, Y, A, B, C in the next six months. If you do it, you'll be on your way. Yeah. And I, I say this to you, success breeds success. Unfortunately, Even a small success. E, unfortunately, failure breeds failure. I will share something with you that I haven't mentioned yet. Do not rush to become a golf professional. Because if you do and you do not have success, you are actually learning how to fail. Mm. I've had this experience with numerous of my players that have turned pro too young and too soon. So I, I strongly emphasize to you, have some success in your state, at your club, if you will, even in some amateur tournaments nationwide. Mm -hmm. And there are so many that you don't even know about that it, it would it shock you. Sonny Hanna being one of the major ones, mm -hmm. uh, Porter Cup being another, the North and South being another. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you folks out there know it, but the North and South at one time as an amateur tournament used to be a major. Hmm. It was the equivalent of the Masters. If you won the North and South as a Western amateur, mm -hmm. you were considered a top player in the nation. Right. You played at the Masters. That's yeah. exactly right. Right, right. So therefore, I suggest to you, compete at the highest level, maintain your amateur status, which by the way, my friend here has just been reinstated yep. Yep. to become an amateur, and now he's in a position where he can enjoy his golf, compete to his heart's delight, 
And if he fails, hey, it doesn't affect his life. It's another notch on the gun so he can learn from. And that's what I suggest to you. You know, one of the things that when we started our journey was that, and I mentioned to you, that it's no longer about being an individual banging balls on the range and reading the, you know, the modern fundamentals. You've got to be part of a team. You've got to have a, a team effort in order to do this. These lone wolf, that's no more. Tiger Woods, I dare say, has up to six, 12 people Absolute. on his team, Absolute. a nutritionist, you know, somebody in the weight room. Uh, and then what I consider and what you have said is the evolution of the modern golf pro is the advent of the sports psychologist. Absolutely. We have discussed this uh, on numerous occasions. Basically, all golf instructors, including myself, are basically just transferring information that we have learned through other fine gentlemen in the game. But truly, the, uh, if you will, advent of new thinking mm -hmm. and revelations is in the field of sports psychology. Bob Rotella, uh, uh, numerous other fine sports psychologists that have, have revealed to the players, this is what you're capable of. And because of self-doubt and whatever. Fear. That's right. Lack of work ethic. Mm -hmm. You are not able to accomplish it. Once, once they realize that they're paying the price, Tiger said it best. I win because I deserve to win. Mm -hmm. Meaning that he is satisfied that he has put forth a supreme effort again to use the word thoroughbred right he has put forth every preparation tool that he's capable of uh, one of which of course is his fine caddy stevie williams right right they do not waste time out there hitting balls there's a specific reason why stevie walks the course i've had the pleasure of meeting stevie and he is as thorough as they come a lot of people don't know that stevie has had his choice of players. At one time, he was Greg Norman's caddy. Greg Norman, yeah. And when Ray Ty Floyd. That's correct. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that. So, as far as money is concerned, Stevie Williams does not need Tiger. Well, I mean, million, that's how he makes a million dollars on the back. Absolutely. I mean, he's he's just a, a cl world class person, and has done a great job for Tiger, mm -hmm. as I must say, as Fluff Cowan did. Right. Because Fluff Cowan is also a very accomplished. PGA Tour caddy. He's on Furyk, the Furyk bag now. That's right, yeah. and was on Pete Jacobson. Right, right. And Pete said, anytime he wants to come home, I'll hire him. Right, right. So right. it's a, a very high compliment. But what I'm saying is, as Trammy just said, the the importance of a team effort, obviously the caddy, the nutritionist, the uh, doctor, the pilot. Okay, now you say, well, what do you mean the pilot? Well, Tiger doesn't fly his own plane. <laughs> You know, I and mean, drive his own car. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, th there's just so much preparation yeah. in everything that's going on. Well, the story is, if you think that you're going to do it on your own, banging balls on the driving. You range, may, but it's highly unlikely. Very. Why not have a team? Why not put a team together? It's just as easy, you know. And if you're able to put the team together, then you're able to answer some of these whys. You know, the whys being. Like we discussed when we were doing our range demonstrations, why the ball is doing this, why the ball is doing that. But more importantly, I think, or as importantly, is the emotional wise. You yes, know, right. why am I so high and which why is, am I so low? Which is exactly what I said to you. To have a player of Damon's, Damon Green's character is unbelievably a tremendous asset.